Good morning. And thank you for coming out on this rather um, murky day. Um, uh, Father Peeber asked me for a few moments today to meditate with you on uh, the mystery of the Eucharist. Um, and in so doing, I'd just like to begin with a little bit of a story. It's a true story. Um, this past Friday evening back at the University at St. John's, I was asked to be part of an event. Uh, we refer to it as the Relay for Life. Um, it's one of these events that uh, purpose is to raise money uh, for cancer research. And the reason why I was asked to be part of this was essentially, I suppose you might say, I come under that category of persons, and it's a category at times I don't fully appreciate, but it's that category that people refer to as survivors. Yeah, because at one point in my life, I had a little bit of an um, encounter with cancer, and because I had a little bit of an encounter with chemotherapy, I qualified to be a survivor. And so I um, was asked to give this sort of main address to an assembly of about 1,600 students, administrators, and others. But, of course, among them, there were survivors. And at one point, a group of people were sitting around talking, and I was in that circle. And they began to talk about the first time that they learned that they had cancer. And all of them seemed to have this rather crisp, you know, crystal clear memory of it. And because I was in the circle, finally they looked at me and they said, well, do you remember? And the truth of the matter is, I didn't. I sort of had to stop and to think about it. And, you know, f finally it dawned on me that the first time I realized something was up was when the uh, dentist that I was then going to uh, was working on my teeth. And he said to me, there's a spot in the back of your throat. We better keep our eyes on that. Um, several months later, we were doing more than keeping our eyes on it. But in the midst of all of this, I, I noticed this guy who said nothing. He was just absolutely quiet. I didn't think a whole lot of it, but afterwards I was walking back to the house. And as I was walking back to the house, uh, I saw him. He, he was in the parking lot. And I was walking by him. And as I walked by him, I put my hand on his shoulder. And to be honest with you, uh, suddenly he started to talk. Uh, about 45 minutes later, he stopped talking. And um, as we prepared to depart, he simply looked at me and he said, you know, thanks for, you know, stopping and walking and talking with me for a little bit. And I began to think about that, how so much of life is transaction that involves stopping and walking and talking. I'm not quite sure if you realize this, but yesterday at the celebration of the Mass, uh, the text that we had for yesterday's third Sunday of Easter was the text from the 24th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. It is the story of what we sometimes call the journey to Emmaus, which was apparently supposed to have been seven miles from Jerusalem. And St. Luke tells us that as the two disciples, Cloopus and another disciple who are unnamed, as they're walking to Emmaus, Luke tells us that Jesus uh, joined them and walked with them. And the first thing that he does when he's walking with them is he, he listens to them. He asks them a question. He says, what were you talking about along the way? And they begin to tell him what they were talking about, which was actually his death. And when they arrive in Emmaus, uh, they press upon this stranger who they don't recognize. They press upon him to remain with them. And he does. And he goes into the house and he breaks bread with them. And in the breaking of the bread, uh, St. Luke tells us they recognize that it was the risen Jesus. 
I'll be really honest with you, I do not have a particularly convoluted or sophisticated understanding of the Eucharist. My understanding of the Eucharist in many ways can be boiled down to this. It is the sacrament in which Jesus joins us and he walks with us and he listens to us and he talks with us. Right now, to be honest with you, I am teaching a graduate course at the university on the Eucharist. It's the theology of the Eucharist. On my way down here yesterday, I was actually reading the third section of St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, questions 73 through 78, in which he discusses the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And to be blunt with you, at the end of this text, which I've read many times, my head was spinning. It was very dense and very terse. And when I put the book down, I realized in my own heart of hearts that for me, the Eucharist is the place where Jesus basically walks and talks, the place where we encounter him, the place where Jesus listens to us. I love this story of the encounter with the resurrected Jesus in Emmaus within the Eucharist. It's my favorite resurrection story, so much so that I once, not too many months ago, brought a book simply because it was entitled The Road to Emmaus. It's a collection of poems, and these are poems by a man by the name of Spencer Reese. When I bought the book, I didn't know he was a priest. Uh, not a Catholic priest, he's an Episcopalian priest. But the book is named after one of the lead poems, which is entitled The Road to Emmaus. And it's a story, in a sense, a poem, prose story, about his visits to a Franciscan sister, Sister Anne. And it's really the story of her listening to him and his speaking with her. But the reason why it's called the road to Emmaus is that at the beginning of the story, there is a little picture on the wall behind her desk. It's a postcard. And it's the picture of the Eucharist celebrated in the town of Emmaus. But towards the end of the story, towards the end of the poem, he finds out that they're gonna close the retreat center. And this is how he puts it. He says, suddenly Sister Anne announced our last meeting. Down the linoleum hallway, Sister Kathleen and Sister Ruth moved and prayed. Their numbers had dropped from seven to six and the nuns decided the retreat house would close. Soon the chapel and the offices would be leveled and replaced with condominiums. Sister Anne, told me about herself that final time. Parents dead, alcoholic brother dead, the brother embarrassed that she had been a nun. She opened her Bible on the shipping box between us, leaned in her hearing aids on, her silver crucifix knocking on her chest. Above her head, a nail where the Emmaus scene had hung. Sister Anne spoke then of the Gospel of John and the Samaritan woman at the well, the one that married nearly as many times as Elizabeth Taylor, and how when Christ listened to her, she became the first evangelist. It was Christ's longest conversation with anyone, Sister Anne said. The Samaritan woman's life changed because Christ listened. When I was a little kid, I used to believe in miracles. I'm talking about the big whopping kinds of miracles. I suppose I still do, which is one of the reasons why I continue to buy my Powerball ticket. But the truth of the matter is, along with that, I also used to believe that I was born too late. How nice. It would have been to live at the time of Jesus and to know him 
and to see him and to encounter him. But what I've learned as I've grown older is that most miracles are small. That if we're going to meet the risen Jesus, we meet him in simple things, bread and wine and the sharing. And I've also learned that in one sense, we're never born too late because every day Jesus comes to us and at this altar he walks with us and listens to us and shares himself with us. And so as Jim sang in the responsorial psalm, perhaps it's a very good thing during this Easter season to remember to taste and see how good the Lord is.